All right, welcome back. This is Good Afternoon Ghana. My name is Aldo Moro. Now, this afternoon, we're uh, delving into the NPP's manifesto, which is was launched at a very successful event in Takrade. But, as you do know, just, just like with all other events, there have been all kinds of commentary which has been passed on this, uh, on this, uh, on the event. Um, and we intend to, you know, bring to the fore some of these issues that have come up as far as the manifesto uh, is concerned. But before we do all of that, the, the, the that's candidate, Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya, who's also the vice president, actually, if you listen to his speech, he sort of divided it into three thematic areas where he gave an account of the stewardship of uh, the MPP. So Naneko Fuadu himself for ATS, uh, he goes ahead to, you know, basically um, outline some of the policy prescriptions or the policy proposals that he has in tackling the problems that bedeviling the people of this country. And then the third part of it is where he makes a pitch, you know, where he tells guardians why um, guardians must trust him and why he's the man for the job and he has a vision and so on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we intend to do this afternoon is that um, we're going to bring you that third part uh, where he makes a pitch telling Ghanaians why he is the man for the job and why Ghanaians must trust him and why he, and the fact that he means business. That's what he says. But before we do that, uh, my resource person for today is a man who's a director of research at the Dankwa Institute, who's also been drafted into the communications team as far as the um, propagating the, uh, the, how do you call it, the content of the manifesto is concerned. I'm talking about Dr. Frank Bano. He's my guest on Good Afternoon Ghana today. Doc, good afternoon. Thank you good so very much you, for joining us. It's a pleasure, sir. Same here. Thank you. So um, before we get into, sir, before we get into specifics, let's watch this. If you want someone you can trust to come up with innovative and impactful ideas to transform Ghana, then it is Dr. Bahumia. If you want someone with personal integrity who can be trusted to fight corruption, then your choice is Dr. Bahumia. And if the person you have in mind is someone you can trust to work tirelessly and selflessly for Ghana, then it is Dr. Bawumia. If you want a leader with a proven record who you can trust to create jobs for the youth, then it is Dr. Bawumia. If you are looking for the man who has the vision and the commitment to prepare Ghana for the fourth industrial revolution, the digital revolution, then it is Dr. Bahumia. If you are looking for the man who is more committed to protecting and using the natural resources for the benefit of Ghanaians, then the answer is Dr. Bahumia. Who will be more accountable to Ghanaians? A one-term president like my opponent or a person who can look to a long-term development of Ghana because he will return to you after four years to render an account for the long term. It is Dr. Bahumia. Who can you trust? Who can you trust to protect free senior high school education? The answer is Dr. Bahumia. Who, who has demonstrated to the development, who has demonstrated a commitment to the development of deprived communities like the, our inner city communities and the Zongo communities. It is Dr. Bawumia. Who can you trust? Who can you trust to provide bold solutions to improve our economy, create jobs, and improve social protection? It is Dr. Bawumia. Ladies and gentlemen, I am determined to make a difference a positive difference. I am determined to use the experience I have earned over the last seven to eight years from the challenges and the priorities 
we have tackled, from the successes we have chalked, to the hard work to succeed with you on the priorities that I have laid before you today. I will work for you, with you, with honesty and integrity, with wisdom and decisiveness. I have clarity of mind as to what I want to do from day one as president. I will not ask you for a honeymoon to cool off and think about what to do with the responsibility you give me. I am Dear Ghanaians, what I have presented today are highlights of my 2024 manifesto. There are many, many more details and policies that can be found in the full version. I implore you all to read the full version. This manifesto we are launching today is a manifesto of hope, a manifesto anchored on both solutions to ushering the golden age of good governance and accountability, a manifesto of possibilities focusing on quantum leaps in jobs and prosperity. Our positive mindset is built on a solid track record of innovations and achievement, unlike our friends who regard every life-changing policy proposal as impossible. We in the MPP see possibilities in, to innovate, deliver, and prosper. I mean to deliver for you, for your family, for your future, for your business. Indeed, Bamiya means business. I thank you all for your support, prayers, and with God's guidance, we can win together. It is possible. Thank you all for your attention. God bless you, and God bless our homeland, Ghana. So those were his concluding and his parting words when he gave that speech uh, during the um, manifesto launch. Doc, you were there. I mean, I'm just wondering when he was making those final concluding remarks, when he was making a pitch as to why he should be the man. I was wondering what you're going through. Did you, um, how was the, of course, you could see from the screens that there was a lot of shouting, there was a lot mm -hmm. of excitement here and there. Personally, how did you feel at the time? Well, I mean, uh, the, 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 what I mean by, if you were in that room at uh, GSTS at that time, okay. Uh, the feeling was quite uh, different. I mean, the euphoria, uh, how packed the room was, and you could see that the atmosphere was very charged, not quite charged, but very charged. Right. I mean, especially when uh, Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya delivered that uh, outstanding speech, specifically standing on his feet from close to about two hours delivering that speech. I mean, it was momentous, and then um, a lot of Party people felt energized, right. if, 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 if that is uh, the modest word I can use. A lot of party people felt energized. And one of the things that most people had also anticipated was like, oh, this manifesto was just uh, barely going to rehash past uh, 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 programs and policies that has been uh, implemented by the current administration, of which he is the vice president. And for that matter, it was more or less going to be about mere continuation, 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 continuation of past uh, policies and programs. But then from his delivery, you realize that whatever that he intends to do, more or less, uh, 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 is a signatory of paradigm shift. Critically, if you analyze uh, some of the things that he spoke about on that day, you could see that he's a man of his own ideas. Okay. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into some specifics on some of the things that he intends to do. But before we do that, let me just say that if you have any comment or contributions or opinions that you intend to, ex you intend to share with us. It's 0244-262-314. 0244-262-314. And it would be uh, shortly displayed on your screen so that you can send us a message and let us know what you make of the manifesto. Have you seen? Have you read it? Have you, have you heard excerpts of it? What do you make of it? Do you find it aspirational? Do you find it exciting? What do you think is in it for you? I'll be more than happy to hear uh, for you. And, and more importantly... To what extent, yeah, to what extent do manifestos influence your voter choices? I'll be more than happy to hear that. Let's do, let's see if we can do some kind of um, um, an unscientific survey on the show uh, this afternoon. Now, before we even get into some specific, like, let's just talk about you. I mean, this is the first time I'm interacting with you. Um, you're the director of research of the Dankwa Institute. How's the Dankwa Institute? Uh, how's it doing? How's, how's DI? Know. Dankwa Institute has been doing well. You know Dankwa Institute's name speaks for itself. I mean, what it stands 
the ideology, the philosophy of J.B. Dankwa, obviously. I mean, uh, Muslim, when you talk about the philosophy and ideology, of course, it's based on the philosophy that ideology was born. And for that matter, J.B. Dankwa's ideology, I epitomize in his own uh, PhD thesis, of course, something that I think uh, the DI is uh, in, the, in the pipeline developing a project to more or less uh, popularize the philosophies which actually gave birth to the ideology of uh, J.B. Denka, the man who is, uh, in most instances, referred to as the doyen of African politics. Of course, uh, you can't do away with it. He's been a giant in our political space, mm. uh, irrespective of uh, political differences. I mean, the literature is there. Recently, I was reading a paper published in the Oxford uh, Journal, uh, published actually in 1952. And, and that was a paper that actually went on to cement the fact that it was actually J.B. JB Dankwa who propounded the name Gan actually oh, yeah. before we we had independence jb Duncan was the one who had actually propounded and, and i can share this paper with That's you which was um, so so of course so so di over the years uh, as you know we are policy think tank and okay. we are research institutions so i don't know if you follow the media space since right. i came on board last year i think somewhere october you joined last year yeah october. last year october okay. yeah okay. mostly we've been most of the things that we've been doing are research oriented and mostly on economic and social issues okay. uh talking especially about the things that my Myself together with, we have also a team of research fellows. Mm. And this team of research fellows has to do with uh, professors, lecturers from uh, various universities across uh, the breadth and length of Ghana. In fact, there are some of the research fellows who are not even in the country. Okay. In fact, myself, I was a research fellow while I was teaching in South Africa at the University of Johannesburg. And obviously, the Dankwa Institute is ably managed by uh, Dr. Antoinette Thibault, I'm sure you know her. Who is also the Deputy General, General Secretary, Secretary for the New Patriotic Party, of course. So uh, uh, she's my boss and I work under her okay. leadership. Right, that's just briefly, um, because I wouldn't want us to spend so much time on, on the Dunk Institute because you are here because of the manifesto. Yeah. But here's the thing. Um, I think the last time we heard, and I stand to be corrected, mm. but the last time we heard the Dunk Institute churn out some kind of a survey was when, was as a lead up to who actually uh, becomes... Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya's running mate. And the Dunkwa Institute actually came up with a research that says that uh, he's the most preferred by the rank and file of the party. Why did the Dunkwa Institute do that? Because I'm sure that you may have heard some of the criticisms that were leveled against you that, no, oh, focus on some other research, not who is, who, who is going to be who's running mate and so on. I mean, don't foray into that. You, you, make, you make the institute to look too partisan. Um, what, what did you... What do you make of some of the feedback that you got when you churn out that kind of research? No, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, I don't know. But well, what I can say is that, you see, prior to Dankwa Institute conducting that research, numerous research or studies have been conducted That's by true. independent bodies. That's true. And there are some that provided quite contradicting uh, results. Mm. In fact, there were some that projected certain candidates yeah. who were perceived to be in the top three mm that even with the Ghanaian populace and with some members within the new, to, new patriotic party find it a bit strange. I'm sure yourself, you might have chance on some of those names. Oh, yes, like, quite, oh, what's quite a number of them. So you yeah. see, so, so, so as, as, a, as a policy think tank and also a research center, we decided it's okay, let's also conduct an independent research to gauge uh, uh, what actually the people, the new patriotic party people, mm -hmm. what actually the members of the party want. Okay. And to some extent, mm -hmm to confirm or deny mm. these existing contradicting findings. Right. And obviously, as you saw our findings, if you looked at the top three people that mm. we discovered from the survey, I mean, it was right on point up to the last end when uh, Honorable Matupuku Prempe was selected by uh, the running mate, uh, the vice president and the flag bearer of the new Petro Party, Dr. Alaji Mahmoud Bamia. Okay. And obviously, the man who came second in mm. our survey, obviously, as rumored, was also part of the last two who were actually shortlisted and then the, 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 the vice president. I'm, I'm just curious, Apple. was the Dankwa Institute somewhat involved in the production of the MPP manifesto, whether directly or indirectly? Were your input sought, for instance, or there was nothing like that? As far as I know with my first, I, as a person, okay. was a member of the identifiable group of okay. the manifesto committee. Which group are you representing? Was it the policy think tanks? Yeah, yeah, so the identified group was a group just put together by the vice president himself. Okay. So basically, our task was to go around speaking to organized non-political groups okay. to seek their opinion. So the CSOs, basically. Yeah, so, so we spoke to Guta, we, we had meetings with Guta, Ghana Chamber 
uh, Ghana Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Mm. We had meetings with the Garages, Asso Garages Association in Ghana. Okay. We had meetings with the Ghana Medical Association. We had meetings with UTAC. We had meetings with UTAC, that is the Technical Universities Association. We had meetings with FIS okay. and organized groups. <laughs> so, no, just to... A tall list of yeah. A tall so, list of so just to solicit your inputs, okay. and, 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 and that will eventually end up in developing this manifesto that was launched on Saturday. That's interesting. And then my boss, obviously, Dr. Antoinette, okay. is, is the director of research for the campaign. I'm sure you know that. Mm. So I'm sure she also may have played a very key role mm. as far as the manifesto. In fact, even with the launching of the manifesto, you saw that she was also one of the pivotal members who played a key role in the launching of the manifesto in Takrat. And of course, on that particular day, she was also a co-MC with uh, Dennis Miracles. Let me mm. use this opportunity to congratulate the MPP for a successful launch of that manifesto manifesto. What kind of feedbacks have you so far received since you launched it? I mean, um, you, you definitely had an objective for launching this mm. manifesto um, because manifestos do quite a number of things. I yeah. mean, yeah. Um, it, it sort of sets the tone mm. for that social contract that you intend to enter into the people, into, uh, with the people of Ghana. Um, it also gives us a sense of the kind of um, economic and social um, policies that you intend to put before parliament when you come to it. In fact, it can be called and make you as far as elections are concerned. Mm -hmm. What kind of feedback have you received since you launched it? Do you think Ghanaians find it aspirational? Do you think it's exciting? Do Ghanaians see their interest actually being catered for in that kind of, in, in this manifesto? What kind of feedback have you, have you had so far? Okay, so I think before then, I want to quickly pass this comment. You know, okay. you, 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 you started your program by saying that you want to use uh, the feedback from your viewers and listenership right. as a gate to see so far whether manifestos influence your your votes or not. Now, the Dakar Institute actually conducted a research last year, December, okay. across the 16 regions in Ghana. Okay. And as part of the research, we wanted to know some of the things that influence uh, Ghanaian voters a choice of candidates in okay. terms of voting for candidates. And, and more it was surprising that one of the findings that we saw, and this was an apolitical finding because we actually conducted this research via our research fellows. So the findings will shock you that a staggering number of about 37, 38% of Ghanaians actually said that they will vote based on party manifesto. That's significant. Yeah. That's significant. Yeah. So and in fact, we, we, this was a population of, I think, about 8,800 across the yeah. country. Yeah. That's messaging. Yeah. 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 So message, messenger. Yeah. Very important. Very important. I see. So, so, so the feedback so far you've received tells you that what is it is it is a good so, so like good piece of so like you really said i mean i'm one of the people the spokespersons uh on the manifesto and right. i have since monday i have engaged numerous media houses including uh metro, metro TV. tv and today i'm here with you and one of the things that i have i if, if i'm summarizing uh there is no doubt in the minds of Ghanaians that this is a manifesto that will seek to transform the Ghanaian economy however the question so far that I have seen or I have heard from Ghanaians is that will it be feasible for the MPP to implement all these policies that are in the manifesto? Then the second thing... Which is the, the, there's a certain feeling that it is a bit overambitious? No, that it's good. It's okay. a bit better, but the policies are too many right. at a time that maybe some Ghanaians have doubt. And that yeah. is why it is our responsibility to explain things to Ghanaian. Okay. Then the other part is, where are we even going to get the money to implement these, all these, these good policies? So I don't know if you would want me to go on. We'll, we'll get there. We'll okay. get there. Uh, we're, we're building up to, we're building mm. to that because, because it's, it's not enough to say we will do something and yeah. this how we intend to yeah. do it. But, uh, but uh, where are you going to get the finance or the, 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 the funds mm. uh, to prosecute or to execute it? So I agree with you that that's a, that's a very legitimate yeah. uh, question. But one of the things that I saw palpably missing in this particular manifesto, if you compare to the ones that we've seen in the past, 2016, 2020, is that we saw a lot of sloganeering in the, <laughs> in, in the previous manifesto. So 1D, 1F, 1 this, 1 million that, blah, 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 blah. You know, we're not seeing that in the manifesto. I yeah. mean, I, I, do I... Will I be right to say that a few lessons have been learned, you know, looking into, I mean, of course, looking at, um, um, at if lessons have been learned from the past? Maru. Or it's just new king, new law, new ways of doing I things? I will tell you this. Okay. The answer is as simple as this. Baumia means business. So is that the reason he's not slogan hearing? That's what I'm saying. Baumia means business. Okay. You see, if you listen to the vice president's speech, and if you listen to his tone on that day, it tells you that he means business. You know, the days of sloganarism is past and gone because we live in a new age, an age which will be determined by the fourth industrial revolution. But, but some will say, but he benefited from the slogan. Of course. But you see, the, the, the past 
shows us the way to the future. Right. And of course, given the past, now I was making a point on uh, one media house, and I was telling them that in, in, in political ca campaign season or in politics, every season determines what the people want. Mm. In fact, I, I went on to make the comment that the preference of people, in fact, if you are, if you are taking the preference of Ghanaian voter, if, if you are making it a scale of preference. Now, between, especially in 2016 mm. and 2020, okay. what we saw from there was that Ghanaians wanted education. And in, and in that context, they wanted free secondary education. Mm. Now, it is one of the reasons why in 2016, close to about one million or a little over one million Ghanaians I mean, when I talk about the, the difference between the, what the NPP accumulated and what the NDC accumulated, more than one million Ghanaians voted difference. in favor on Nana Kufuad of the first amendment of the Fourth Republic unprecedented to become president. So at that momentous occasion, it tells, it tells us that, look, Ghanaians were much interested in education, mm. secondary school education. Now, fast forward, Nana Kufuad was given the nod. Dr. Mahmoud Baumia became his vice president. And through to their words, that was the most important policy or program on their manifesto. And by 2017, by the first quarter of 2017, that policy has been implemented. And today, because of free SHS, we have close to a little over about 3.2 million Ghanaians who are in school free. And government has spent close to about 9.9 .9 billion cities on it. Mm. Now, when Dr. Alhaj Mahmoud Babia went around the country, and he said that after he visited the 16 regions. Now, this time around, the preference of Ghanaians shifted mm. from education. So if, as he rightly stated, now I, I'm saying shifted because Ghanaians had been, Nane Kufadu has delivered free secondary school education. So now, the issue wasn't about education, like give us free secondary education. Because previously, and I use my case for example, Moro, I tell people that at a point in time, because of 23 Ghana cities, I would have been a dropout. Had it not been my uncle who intervened. 23 Ghana cities. Mm. I would have been a dropout from se senior secondary school. Right. So it tells you that at that point in time in 2016, what the Ghanaian taught to be of most priority was the fact that the Ghanaian would love to see his or her child in school. My mother did not attend school. So I tell you that at any point in time, if by then there was a president or there was a candidate who was actually vying for office and he had proposed that I was going to provide free secondary education, I'm sure it would have influenced my mother's vote to vote for that candidate. So you're saying that free SHS was the game changer for you? In 2016. As far as your campaign message in 2016 is concerned? Yes, of course. But yes. that's going into the future. But here's the thing. But the free SHS was also promised in 2012. Why didn't Ghanaians vote for you? So that's what I'm saying that at that point... If indeed, if indeed you believe the free SHS is the, the, the magic one. Yeah. In 2012, in fact, you promised it in 2009. Yeah. Um, sorry, in 2008. You promised it in 2012. But you were only able to get the votes in 2016. Yeah. How do you then convince Not just the votes. Overwhelming well, votes. Well, that's, that's fine. Mm. But how then do you convince me that Free SHS did a trick? It did a trick. You, know, you, see, you see what? You see, in 2008, you see, the Ghanaian political space has evolved more. Mm. Now, if you remember back in 2008, and I always make this point, that until Dr. Alhaj Mahmoud Bamiya joined Ghana's political scene, it was always about mountain platforms, pulling water, or what do you call it? Is it yellow gallons? Mm. And just asking, are you able to buy the fuel? Mm. You will bear with me mm. that that was the era of Ghana's political space. Mm. It was just about mounting platforms and just making wild statements. Now, fast forward into 2007, Dr. Laj Mahmoud Bamiya was selected as running mate for candidate, then candidate, and now president, mm. Ekufu Ado. Mm. And he changed the political space and the political discourse. Now, today, you see that you find someone who has even been president before, trying to mount a podium and do a presentation, of which even in 2012 he was not doing. Why? Because Dr. Ahal Mahmoud Maumia, over the years, has revolutionized the political space. Likewise, like I said, in 2008, let's not forget, in 2008, the first round, Nene Kufuado had just a deficit of less than 30,000 votes mm. to win the elections, if you can you remember. If I'm even right, I'm talking about the first round vote. I think he needed about 24,000 votes. So that clearly tells us that 
Ghanaians wanted that policy. Mm. Now, it did not materialize. And we went for the second round, and things changed. Mm. And the political party that had overpromised mm. beyond free SHS said they were going to implement one-time premium. In fact, not to take you back, and I like data enough, ISA, or ISA, at Ligon, mm -hmm. did a study after the 2008 general elections, I think somewhere 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. to find out why Ghanaians voted for the then candidate, late president, John Evers Atamels. Mm -hmm. And most, more than, I think more than 53, 55% of the respondents said they voted for him because he promised a one-time premium health insurance. Okay. So I think that okay. So I think the point, the, 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 your point is that messaging is key. It's key, yeah. Very but key. don't you also think that equally important is also the performance of the party in government? Very true. I mean, which I mean, is which is that before people look forward to what it is that you're promising them, based on the problems on the horizon, they are also looking at the, the current circumstances in deciding which direction they want to vote. And the truth of the matter is that not not many Ghanaians have not been particularly impressed with this government because they feel that. The economy was one of the key reasons why they voted into power in 2016. Dr. Mahmoud Bamia was then the was then the arrowhead. He was then the poster boy. He was yeah. all over the place pontificating about how he intends to deal with the economic problems of this country. So if today we're back to where we are, 2024, and Ghanaians, the same Ghanaians are complaining that the economy is 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 bad. Um, we've had inflation of never mind the fact that it's coming down. We've had um, uh, how do you call it? Um, um, the DDEP, which has sort of decimated people's savings. I can go give a tall list of things that are mm. affecting. Basically, mm. there's a lot. There's a cost of living crisis. You're saying that we should, we should jump over these problems and just look at the manifesto because the, because there's some good news in the manifesto. No, no, that, that's not what I've seen. Far okay. from that. I mean, right. I can never even make that statement okay. on a media house like yours. And I mean, rightly, my candidate the vice president and the flag bearer of the new patriotic party himself mm, okay. said it on that day right. that he admits that cost of living is still on the rise, if you remember, in True. his speech. True. He said that. True. So I can never say anything, and, and I'm speaking as an economist, so I can never make that statement. Now, what I'm trying to say is that let's just compare records mm. because it is, it, is, it, is, it is a choice between light and darkness. Mm. The NPP being the light and the NDC being darkness. Now, let's compare the records of the two candidates who are vying for office. We are talking about the economy. Let's compare economic records under both. Now, let's pick candidate John Dramani Mahama. Before we get there, mm. it's very interesting. Uh, mm. But also remember that, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, I'll, mm. I'll allow you to go on with this. But also remember that the economy is not just from the perspective of the, the managers of it, sure. i.e. macroeconomic indicators, sure. both macro micro, sure. but it's also from the perspective of the voter and how they feel about of the course. current circumstances. So in doing that, I'm just saying that, I just bear that in mind. Just yeah, in case sure. you just joined us, we're looking at the MPP manifesto, which was launched in Takradi, uh, the capital city of um, the Western region, and um, what is in it for you, and whether it would influence your choices in these elections, 7 December, uh, when we, or you're just going to look at your current situation and vote. So we want to know what has come. What, what are the, the issues that are going to be playing out as far as your uh, decision to vote for A or B is concerned? So we'll take a short break while we come back. Uh, good afternoon, continues.
All right, welcome back. This is Good Afternoon Ghana. My name is Aldo Moro. Just in case you just joined us, we're looking at the MPP's manifesto that they launched in Takra, the GSTS Auditorium. My guest this afternoon is Dr. Frank Bano. He's the head of research, Dankwa Institute, and also a member of the communications team on their manifesto. Um, you can call it the preaching of their manifesto gospel. Um, he's, been, he's, been, he's been here with us. We've touched on quite a number of things about Dankwa Institute, whether they made some input into the thing. And uh, we got to the point where he was talking about the importance of a manifesto uh, in shaping the opinions of people. In fact, he says it's backed by research that shows that people take messaging, very campaign messaging, very, very serious. Then I asked him that, yes, indeed, nobody can wish that away, nobody can dispute that, but it is also a fact that people take their current circumstances, and I hear him talking about the economic circumstances, mm. much more seriously. And I said, it is even becomes more pronounced because the man who is leading the MPP, you hear his critics say, was the man who was was pontificating about the economy and said he had the magic wand. He said he, has, he, had, he had the solution to our economic problems. And so if today the same man is saying he can deal with the economy, why should we believe him? And that's where we had to take a break. And he said the man's track record, he said he was going to actually argue that the man's track record is better than the, uh, the NDC's candidate. So he's going to get there. So, uh, Doc, I don't know whether we must even <laughs> spend a lot of time trying to compare. Maybe just briefly. Briefly. <laughs> yes. okay. In terms right. of the economic yeah, conditions. Because, because see, the, I'm not going uh, to speak to microeconomic variables. No. Okay. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sure right. that's why you didn't want uh -huh. me to. Do. Because, I'm not because going to do my, that. my point so, is. So, so, so what I'm going okay, to speak to is like. Okay. Like, like I rightly said, and like Vice President himself okay. said, that he admits that cost of living has been on yeah, the rise. Right. But comparatively, okay. if you compare our case to 2013, 2014, mm. We can say that Ghanaians are better off today. Why do I make this? Okay. Now, in 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, the entire country was plunged into doom so. In addition to that, actually, especially in 2014, Ghanaians had to go and queue at the gas stations to look for food. Moro, you might, be, you might have queued then if you were in Ghana those times. Right. At the filling station, irrespective of the economic challenges that we have had, which has been exacerbated by the pandemic, which has been exacerbated by the Russia-Ukraine, where you and I, sitting here as Ghanaians, can confirm that never a day, a minute, or a second, and that this MPP government, Antanane Kufuado and Alaji Dr. Babud Bamia, has Ghanaians gone to the filling station to queue for gas or to queue for petrol? Mm. Never has the entire country been plunged into darkness for more than 50 days. Recently, yeah, we had yeah, some yeah, light yeah, and you saw how Ghanaians we, were, were, were angry. We, we and never, I say we, that I never, agree with Ghanaians. We, we've never had a situation where the entirety of the country was plunged into darkness. Yes. We had some load shedding. Exactly. So somebody has light, somebody doesn't. And for how many days? But even that. We've that was had, 10 weeks. Yeah. That was 10 weeks. Yeah, but, yeah, but, and, so but what, see, I'm not, what, what excuse do you have to have been plunged into no, darkness no, no, so, for 10 so, weeks? I'm, I'm not saying so. What yes. I'm trying to say is that. I, I have made on several platforms that I agree with Ghanaians who were angry yeah. because never again do Ghanaians want to hear anything about doom so. Mm -hmm. So the fact that Ghanaians had to endure 10 weeks or something that they thought, hey, are we going back to, uh, what do you call it? Like the, the Israelites escaping Mizrim, Egypt. Mm -hmm. And now the signs are like, are we going back to Egypt so that we'll be slaves again? You see, that was a signal. And okay. I agree with Ghanaians. So quickly, the president again and his team had to step in and say, look, we have to do everything to make sure that the Israelites so don't that, return okay, to So you're Israel. saying that you've done better in terms of keeping our lights on? Yeah. Okay. And what else have you done better? In, that's what I'm saying, that okay. keeping the lights on okay. affects businesses. Okay. Remember, yes. ISA themselves did a research mm. when Dumso was in full swing that close to over 100 million USD was but, lost as a result of But your administration has also been, has set a record. Never in the history of this country have we been faced with a situation where Ghana owes so much that he can't pay his debt to the point where persons who have saved their money, have actually bought bonds from government, are picketing at the finance ministry day in, day out and asking you to pay them their bond, to, to pay them their coupon. That is very that's true. That's historic. That, is that has true. never happened before. That is very true. But, but you see, that's why I didn't want to go into the microeconomies. Okay. So we ask our, our, yes. ourselves, okay. 20, 2017, 2018, 2019, an average growth rate of Six percent. Mm. You have the lowest inflationary rate in 2018, 2019. I think okay. about seven point nine percent under the under Nana Kufuado and uh, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. 
When at the same time, if you compare before we assumed office, we were doing barely 3.3% in 2016, 2.9% in 2015, I think 26 or 7% in 2014, under former President John Dramani Mahama. And this was without COVID-19 or this was without any Russian-Ukraine war. Fast forward. Yeah, but, the, but the NDC will also tell you about the problems that they faced at the time. The price prices of cocoa had fell drastically. <laughs> they had a problem with the Jubilee fields, the Tariq Belly bearing. I mean, so the oil from the fields were not coming. <laughs> so how are you Going to be a, so I'm saying that they, they also had no my, my point is it, every is it, political party can give reasons why yes. the economy but but you see it's is, is, is faced with is all it, kinds is of it, challenges. Is it, this is a global challenge yes. that almost brought the most advanced economies on their knees. Yeah, but managing an economy is not exclusive of some of these headwinds. No, 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 no. When you're managing is the it, economy, you must understand that these headwinds are no, the, there's no, always the no, possibility no. of some of these things happening. No, Moro, that, 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 that can't be true because, so, you see, so you cannot, I, I, that is I, not is excusable. You know Janet Yellen. Okay. You know Janet Yellen. Right. She is the uh, Federal Reserve Secretary, more or less the governor of the U.S. Bank. Okay. She, she herself made a statement to the U.S. Assembly and told them that, look, no one, no economist, no analyst could have predicted the impact that COVID-19 pandemic would have had on the global economy. But so this about, is a fact. Yeah, but how about the impact of the 21 billion that you made through the COVID contingency fund? So, so, 21 so, billion. So then someone, 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 someone also... There's also 60 billion central bank funding. So someone also asked the question. So you, you made... I mean, so you rate to... What, 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 what about... You rate somebody. What about the contingencies? Yes. The un, unplanned budget. Remember, in 2020, government had already submitted budget in November 2019. Okay, never mind. Yes. The point is... Okay, never mind. We can go on and on and on about yes. this. Never mind. The fact of the matter is that times are hard. Yeah. That's very and, true. And Ghanaians voted for the MPP to make their lives yeah. better. Fact of the matter is that when people take their lived experience, when people take their living conditions, they feel they are worse off, right? Now, how then do you, do you convince that Ghanaian that you, the same person who has made them impoverished or make them poorer, can make them can, can take them out of this situation. How does this document solve this, that, that problem? So, 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 like you gave the preamble to the manifesto, and like Dr. Mahmoud Mamouya himself rightly spoke to the manifesto. Okay. I mean, he spoke about where we were, mm. where we came to, and where we are going. Okay. So, you see, today, the growth rate that dimmed, today we are, first quarter, we've done, I think, about 4.7%. It's picking back. It's picking back. It's picking Inflation, back. like he rightly says, is dropping. Yes. So, that tells us that clearly yeah. we are the people, Dr. Alhaj Mahmoud Mamouya is the man to take us out. Of the global crisis that struck us yeah, as a country. So, so can, we then say, things, can we then say he was the same man who plunged that into that difficulty? No, no, no. So that's what I've explained that Janet Yellen herself. You okay. see, this is the almighty U.S. We are not even talking about an African country. Whereas you could bring in the argument that maybe... Is that, is that so, sorry, sorry for that. Let me just do this quickly. I'm not going to... I'm not going to heckle you again. <laughs> is that to suggest that the MPP is saying that it did nothing wrong on hindsight? Setting policy decisions or prescriptions that perhaps on hindsight did not do us any good in terms of managing this economy. Is the MPP saying I mean, which that era, which, 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 which era are you talking about? Are you talking about from 20, the post-pandemic period? Is no, that what you're well, talking about? Post-pandemic. Yeah, even, because even, because even, pre-pandemic no, were fine. Whether pre or mm. post. Because, because the decision like started a, from 2017. So, so, so that's why I've told you that the pre... The from, borrowing, for instance, is one of the things that yeah, you've been in, accused in, of. In, in fact, 2019, what was our debt-to-GDP ratio? Okay. In 2019, our debt-to-GDP ratio was about 67%. Right. Far lower than what the MPP actually inherited in 2016, okay. which is about 73.1%. Right. So obviously, when you talk about the monetary policy rate, it was far lower than what the MPP inherited. If you talk about the inflation, it was far lower than what the MPP inherited. In fact, between 2017 to 20, uh, 2019, Thing. Ghana has one of his highest reserves mm. compared to what the MPP inherited, okay. which was two months import cover in 2016. Mm. The MPP actually by 2019 had hit 4.8 months import cover. Right. So clearly, the, both the macroeconomic variables tells you that yes, Ghana was on, on yeah, the, the right path. The trajectory was on the right direction. Was on the right path until, until, until COVID path. hit. Yes, and in fact, I was in South Africa then. The South African economy in that year grew by negative. So, so you don't accept the argument that the NDC makes, that a lot of the things that were recorded post-2016, so 2017, 2018, were all passed through effect of the policies that they had implemented, that you, you basically just inherited the what the NDC will term as the good policies that they, that, they rolled that, out. That, that, that can be true. Because the NDC actually joined IMF in 2015. They didn't join in 2016. But, that also, but didn't that help? 
That's what I'm saying. I'm in taming so, so that's what your I'm expenditure. Giving, I'm, I'm giving the instances. Okay. In 2016, there was an inflow. 2015, yes. there was an inflow. Yes. 2016, there was an inflow. Yes. How come that they couldn't turn the community around? GM says, then by 2017, we were able to turn it GM around. GM says, as soon as, you, am, as soon as you came out of IMF, then that's when you went. No, but which year did you come out of IMF? 2019. <laughs> that, that's, that can't be true. Because the reason I'm saying that can't be true is that, you see, in 2020, okay. we had GDP growing at 0.5%. Mm. Okay. And that's why I say it is because of the pandemic. Okay. Now, Moro, let's look at GDP growth rate in 2021, okay. before the Russian-Ukraine war. Right. GDP growth rate in 2021 actually rebounded to 5.1%. What did you do for that GDP growth rate to, to have rebounded? Yes, of course. So that's what I'm saying. That the post, remember, the post-pandemic, there were a lot of programs and policies that the government put in place. Oh, you mean you're talking post-pandemic? Yeah, okay. post I'm talking I about post-pandemic. Post -pandemic. There were a lot okay. of programs. In fact, remember, it was oh, oh, at that time that we said government should tighten its own belt. You remember, government said it has taken about 50% of some ministerial allowances and fuel and other. There were so many programs that... Okay. okay. Let's not look at, yeah. let's look at, because we're going to go on back and forth about yeah. what went wrong and what didn't go, what, what went wrong and what went right. This manifesto, yeah. what is it that me sitting here, the people who are watching us, why is why must this why is this why does this manifesto ma manifesto matter? What is in it? Moro, it matters to you and your listenership. Okay. Why do I say so? Moro, View, viewership, actually. Your viewership. Yes. Thank you. Moro, since independence, 1957, the tax regime that we have practiced has been the one that we inherited from our colonial masters. Mm. In fact, in 1959, just two years after independence, Ghana had its first fiscal deficit. That is, Ghana's expenditure exceeded its internally generated revenue. Okay. That is tax revenue. And since then, the country hasn't recovered from this shock. Okay. Now, amazingly, since that period to today, mm. nothing has also been done about the tax regime. Okay. We've had a tax regime that makes the poor worse off. Mm. Whereas the rich gets better off within the fiscal space. At the same time, we also have a fiscal framework that imposes a lot of burden on traders. And when I talk about fiscal framework that imposes a lot of burden on traders, I'm specifically talking about port duties. Okay. We, are in, we are an import-dependent economy. Mm. And most of the goods that we even use here, even when we have local manufacturing companies here, most of the products that they use, the raw materials that they use is imported. For example, if I should cite a typical example, it's the cement industry. Right. You know that the clinker, which is the main ingredient for manufacturing cement or producing cement, okay. is imported from outside. Okay. Now, a situation whereby you get to the port and you have to pay exorbitant duties and rates, then it means that at the end of the day, you are also going to increase the price per unit, which is also going to mean that the price that the good will be sold on the market would also go up, which will also mean that the poor who could have afforded maybe two units of that commodity may no longer be able to afford even a unit of that commodity at all. Okay. So that is how such regimes make Ghanaians worse off. Okay. And Dr. Alhaj Mahmoud Bamiya said, look, he has been vice president. He has played his role well as assigned to him by the president. And after helping the president to implement a very vital policy or vital policies, one of the things that he has said that maybe there wasn't time for us to do was to change or restructure our fiscal regime. Mm. So in this manifesto document, he talks about the fiscal regime. In fact, after rebounding our economy, that is the next thing that he talks about. And say, look, I am going to now introduce what we call a flat tax rate. In fact, I, like I was telling you, I had opportunity to sit in meetings with Guta, with Ghana Chamber of Commerce and Industry. They told me that, my brother, we are patriotic citizens. We love our country. We would want to contribute our quota to the development of this country. However, the current fiscal regimes is not favorable. It's still cumbersome. It's yeah? cumbersome. It's complicated to extend that some of our members, if not most, have to find ways to avoid payment of certain taxes. In fact, they even went on to tell us that some of our members, instead of importing things through Temahabo, rather import things through Lome. Because if you go to Lome today, my brother, and people say it's duty-free, it's not duty-free. That is for essentials. Even in Ghana here, there are essentials that we give duty-free, like medicinal things and others. So it's not true. Now, in Lome, let me give you an example. When you are importing something like a vehicle from maybe Canada or America. any part of the America or any part of the world, the rate is 5 to 20% of the price of the vehicle. Okay. In addition to uh, the registration fees, the VAT, or what we call the CIF, and also ecological tax, depending on the overage nature of the car, and so on and so forth. But when you come to Ghana, our rate is 37%. 
And this 37%, you are now coming to add the registration fees. You are now coming to pay the VAT, which also includes the CIF. You are now coming to pay the ecological tax, depending on the age of your car. And you are also going to add all this into the 30. So by the time you finish, you are paying close to about 60, 65% of the cost that you used to import. Yeah, but we need revenue. No, but you see, you need revenue, that is true. But you don't overburden the later people who are paying revenue. And that is why this manifesto seeks to widen the base for collecting revenue. Because if you look at the data that Dr. Mahmoud Bahamia presented, look, let me just paint a picture to you. Now, our 2024 budget, government plans to spend 20, 220 billion Ghana cities in the revised budget. Now, our projected revenue is about 178 billion okay. Ghana cities. Now, if you take 178 billion from 220, approximately, that is about 50 billion Ghana cities. That's that is the that's deficit. That's, uh, okay, deficit. That's the deficit. Mm. Right. Now, study from the GRE conducted in 2023 tells us that if we can even broaden the existing tax base by 13%, that alone could fetch us 150 billion Ghana cities. 150 billion Ghana cities. And I've told you that our 2024 budget deficit is just a little, or it's, it's, an, it's not even 50 billion, but let's, let me run it to 50 billion. So that tells us that if we are able to broaden the tax base and relax the, the rate at which tax is levied on Ghanaians, and we are getting more people on board. We don't need to overburden the small group of formalized taxpayers. And this is the argument that Dr. Alhaj Mahmoud Bamiya is making. So that's with taxes. That is with taxes. Okay. Now look, a country like Estonia has implemented a flat rate. Mm. Look, the GDP of Estonia was $6.2 billion. Okay. As in 2000 before they implemented. Fast forward today, the GDP of Estonia has more than 300 to 400 percent growth to 26.3 billion dollars. In fact, before Estonia established a flat rate system, Estonia has could count the number of companies or businesses that had been cited in Estonia. Okay. More as we sit here today, by 2014 to 2016, over 20,000 businesses, and I have the data here. By the economist, this is the economist reporting. This is not Dr. Frank Banner reporting. 20,000 businesses had cited in Estonia because of the fiscal regime that the government changed. So clearly, if we can change the fiscal regime, and this will not only attract your own people to contribute to national development, but it will also attract investment, as it has been seen in Estonia, as it has been seen in South Africa, as it has been seen in Brazil, then of course we need to do something about this. Is that a, is that a headline? Would you consider this as the headline um, uh, campaign message for this manifesto, which is the taxation the, the, the restructuring of the tax regime. Is, of that, course. is that a headline? Okay. Of course, of course. And it because, not just the headline, it can be because, one of the major, major headlines. Would, because I think that, the, 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 so the thing is, it will stimulate uh, the growth of businesses and that to a very large Will also level. increase your tax revenue. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah. That's fine. It's unfortunate because um, we've, we've done an hour already and uh, there's another program that's coming up. It's an intimate review. <laughs> and my, my, my producer has been... <laughs> <laughs> Your producer should it just it be it one cry. minute to talk it about it one it thing. It, it, it cry for my ears inside. Just, just time, one time. thing, Mr. Uh, producer. All right. uh, Please. Uh, I probably have a lot of messages here too. Let me just do this quickly and then you can use just 30 seconds if you can okay. do that. But Sam Kelly from East Ligon says, good afternoon, Mr. Morrow. Please ask your guest in the studio whether he has um, ever had a financial haircut in his entire life as a Ghanaian. They can continue to tickle themselves and laugh, but the Ghanaian voter is the best to determine whether he is worse off or not come December 2024. This one from Mamiya says that I like the manifesto. Fantastic. I'll vote based on that. That's Mamiya from... Where? Um, Awoshi. Okay, it's not Awoshi. It's Awoshi. Please add, add the E. Uh, my name is Salifu from Asham, and I want to ask the man in your studio the following questions for me. Who took the dollar from what, 4 to 16? To who promised Palugu Dam and couldn't build it? Please the man, tell the man to stop wasting his time, else I'll be tempted to say he is um, suffering from something. I'm not going to read that. I'm sorry. I don't like to read messages that attack, that attack people's personality. Good afternoon, Mr. Moro. My name is Paul from Ayawaso uh, East. A vice president who was called to come fix our economy is telling us now that he sees that the vice president is relevant because for the past seven and a half years, he didn't do anything on his own. No, he didn't say that. Let's not spin some of these things. But anyway, this one says, uh, Sir Joe from Bolagatanga says, good afternoon to you and to your viewers. In fact, the vice president delivered a manifesto that was heart touching and I believe he can change the fortune of the country. Um, the part that touched me most was his admission to the fact that Ghanaians are undergoing hardship. The cause of the hardship and the proposed solutions to the hardship. For me, that's great. Okay, good afternoon. As a 
Ghanaian always votes for political parties because of their manifestos. The manifesto of Dr. Bamiya is a Ghanaian-centered manifesto. And this one here says, it doesn't matter which manifesto they produce, we'll vote them out. Okay, so there's lots, lots of messages. 30 seconds, because there's another yeah. message that's coming. So, Just 30 so, seconds. So, so like, like okay. the last caller, right, Lizzie? Yeah. Dr. Alhaj Mahmoud Bahamia mm. is a compassionate leader. Okay. He has admitted on stage that, yes, the MPP government has done so much. However, he still admits... And, and, and not to take words from the way the words will come. He still admits, and I said this, that he still admits that there's more work to be done. There's more work to be done, and the Ghanaians are going through. So that's one of the things that he has seen that if given the nod, and inshallah, Ghanaians will give him the nod. Okay. Businesses okay. are going to be his focus. All right. That businesses will be incentivized okay. to deliver more jobs All right. to the ordinary Ghanaians. Thank you very much for your time. Dr. Frank Bano has been my guest, the Director of Research, um, Danko Institute, and also a member of the communications team on the manifesto. My name is Aldo Thanks for watching. Bye bye.